Again, this is uh, the Juno, Alaska Music Matters musicians who are going to play some songs for us and then introduce their program. Thanks, everyone, and welcome to the 2014 Governor's Awards for the Arts and Humanities. Hi, my name's Jemima Vera Basanga. I'm a third grader at Glacier Valley Elementary School. The 30 of us up here represent over 400 GM students in Juneau, Alaska. 300 of them are kindergartners and first graders. We're the, old, we're the oldest, the third graders. <laughs> Many people wonder why music matters. Here's why m I think music matters. Music matters because it makes me feel alive and it makes me feel fresh. Thank you, Jemima. 
it makes me feel alive too when I play, so thank you for that. I'm Lori Hagee, I'm the director of Juno Alaska Music Matters Jam, and we are so happy and proud to be here. Thank you so much for having us. We're a research-based program. Uh, we know that when you start early, you make a difference for kids, and when you place a violin in a kindergartner's hands, you not only train their ear for language, but they develop focus, discipline, teamwork, impulse control, <laughs> 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 and the understanding that it takes effort and hard work to accomplish great things. So we want to thank you, and we want to thank the Juno community for investing in all of our kids. We have three of our schools, over 400 who are learning violin, and the third graders are the oldest. So um, thank you for investing in the arts, because all of the arts ma matter. So Jemima, what are we going to play next? The next songs we are going to play are Can Can and Old Joe Clark. Watch out for Can Can, it's very powerful. <laughs> Thank you. 
broadcast of the Governor's Arts Awards is made possible by the Office of the Governor, Conoco Phillips, the Alaska State Council on the Arts, the Alaska Humanities Forum, and 360 North. Well, thank you, everyone. Welcome to, uh, thank you, the Lori and the Jam musicians. That was fantastic, wasn't it? I'm so proud of these children. <laughs> Well, good evening. My name is Tim Lampkin. I'm going to serve as your MC this evening. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone again to the 2014 uh, Governor's Awards for the Arts and Humanities. I'm, I'm pleased to be your host this evening. I was uh, uh, to, uh, to honor these people that uh, help make Alaska a richer place to live. I was really honored and flattered to have been invited to this event, although I had to admit that uh, I'm, ha I'm a theater guy. I, I don't really have much uh, humanities background and so forth, but I, th I thought I would at least try to offer something this evening in terms of maybe a little bit of poetry. And so I wrote some little uh, uh, limericks and so forth that I thought I'd share with you to help maybe break, break some more lightness to the evening. But it's been really a challenge to me as, you know, I had to really think long and hard about what, you know, how to start off. But I, I think for, for beginners, I'd just say, well, roses are red, <laughs> violets are blue, I silenced my cell phone, and so should you. <laughs> we'll start with that. So first I'd like to say thank you to Tom uh, Loker and uh, Wayne Norland uh, for providing us with such wonderful music and, and Clay Good uh, during our reception. I'd also like to recognize, thank you, yep, a round of a round please. I'd also like to thank the Office of the Governor. He's a treat to have him join us here this evening, as well as Conoco Phillips, Alaska, and to please refer to your programs for the uh, list of other folks that have helped sponsor this, this evening. Um, so I'd also like to acknowledge some distinguished guests that we might have here tonight. Do we have uh, local legislators? Maybe legislators you might stand, we can recognize you and thank you so much for your support of the arts and humanities. <laughs> University of Nagayak. It's difficult for me to see with the stage lights, but if you are here, please uh, let us recognize you. We appreciate that very much. Um, again, my, my name is Tim Lampkin. I'll be serving as your MC this evening uh, for this is uh, for this year big artsy thing. And, and before we proceed, I I would ask that you please do heed that tonight there are going to be some pretty cool awards happening. Um, we're pleased to see that the governor is here with us and the first lady, Sandy. Thank you for coming. He'll be joining us on stage here shortly to help pre present the actual awards to these recipients. Uh, and now, if we would, please uh, have, uh, we have uh, Sherry Patterson and Tom Loker as our guests to perform the Alaska flag song. Please join us. stars of gold on a field of blue Alaska's flag may it mean to you the blue of the sea the evening sky the mountain lakes and the flowers nearby the gold of the early sardos dreams the precious gold of the hills and streams the brilliant stars in the northern sky the bear the dipper and shining high the great Yeah. 
Thank you so much, Sherry. And now I'd like to welcome Dr. Rosita Rural, president of the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute, to provide us with a special welcome. Thank you. Honorable Gover Governor and First Lady Sandy, honorable legislators and distinguished guests and past recipients of the Governor's Awards for the Arts and the Humanities. Gunnachi Shanyat Kusani, noble people of Alaska, thank you for allowing me to welcome you to the homeland of the Clinkets, to the homeland of the Akwan, and to share with you our goodwill. I am obligated by my cultural protocols to introduce myself as a means of honoring my ancestors and expressing my love for my children and those yet to come. Yadeklatsak kakahani yuchatuasak, jakna ayachat, shangu kwedi nechatsati, kaudli ayi hit ayachat, jishkat kwan ayachat. My Tlingit name is Yedeklitsak. It is an ancient name whose meaning has been lost in time. My ceremonial name is Kahani, which means woman who stands in the place of a man. It records a historical event and speaks to the status of women in Tlingit society. I am an eagle of the Thunderbird clan and the house lowered from the sun and a grandchild of the Sakai clan. I am deeply honored to be among you, you who make Alaska a richer state, you who are engaged and who support the arts and humanities and who enrich the culture of Alaska and the lives of Alaskans. I am humbled to be among the distinguished individuals who are the recipients of the 2014 Governor's Award for the Arts and Humanities. Thank you for your dedication. Thank you for your lifelong work and for making Alaska an even greater state. Even as we face physical, fiscal dilemmas, we must never forget that it is the arts and humanities that binds generations together, that unify the wonderful cultural and ethnic diversity of this state, that gives greater meaning to our lives and enriches our lives and daily activities. Thank you for being part of this gift to humanity. If I may, I now call on our protecting power to be among us and to honor and celebrate the noble honorees. Ha shagenya, ha shagenya, ha yishani, gunalchish, ha tlatsini, ha at wuskuwu, ha at chayi, ha ani, ka ha kustiyi, ha jit iyati. Gunalchish, Gunalchish, Hashagenya. Our protecting power, our protecting power for having mercy on us, thank you. Our strength, our knowledge, our food, our land, our way of life, you gave to us. We are thankful. We are thankful. Our protecting power, Hashagenya. Good luck, Trish, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much.
for those of you who are eagle eyes and follow your programs closely, I have to say I'm not Ben Brown. Um, I'm actually Joan Braddock, we reversed the order. Um, I'm the chair of the Alaska Humanities Forum Board of Directors and I'm delighted to be here tonight. Um, I would welcome all of you and I'm happy to see so many people here. I, there's a lot of uh, comings and goings that got a little disrupted tonight, but I'm really happy to see you all here tonight. Um, I uh, also would like to express that we are just delighted to have this event in Juneau this year, and we're very excited about the new for, uh, format for this event. Um, thank you. And besides uh, giving you a hearty welcome tonight, I have one other duty, and that is to introduce Ben Brown, who's my counterpart at the Arts Council. Council. Ben. That was a very sweet introduction. I served on the uh, Alaska Humanities Forum Board a long time ago. I was a Wally Hickel appointee, actually. The second Hickel administration, not the first one, obviously. <laughs> There are age limits on these things. Uh, but it's a wonderful organization, and under Joan and Nina Kempel, its current executive director, CEO's leadership, I think it's going from strength, strength to strength, and we are so glad to have you as a partner in this event. Moving it to Juno has been an, an ambitious project, but you're all here, the governor's here, Mrs. Parnell, you're here. Uh, you're all here, so I think we're very grateful to have that happen. I wanna say hi to everyone who's watching online, because we're also streaming this over 360 North, Thanks to our friends across the street at KTOO, Capital Community Broadcasting. Some of you were able to come to the event that preceded this event over at the Alaska State Museum. So I also want to specifically thank uh, the incomparable Bob Banghart, the chief curator of the State Museum, for letting that happen. You, you probably know that museum is only going to be there for 30 more days, and there's some great art on the walls, and there's some great permanent collections upstairs. We're gonna keep those, right, Governor? Right, Bob? Right. Th those aren't going anywhere. They're gonna be put into that new building that you see erected behind it as we speak, and that's a very exciting project that's going to make Juno an even better capital city uh, and an even better leader for the arts and culture in Alaska. So again, Bob, thank you, thank you, thank you. And next year, uh, stay tuned for the reception location. It won't be at the Triangle, it's too small. <laughs> um, next, I must thank Nancy DeCherney, the Executive Director of the Juno Arts and Humanities Council. I was on the JHC board when we hired Nancy, and before we moved to this location, we were in a small downstairs uh, venue in Franklin Street that had a little gallery. It wasn't a full-on performance space that had events uh, four out of seven nights every week the whole year. It certain w certainly wasn't something that could have hosted an event like this, and Nancy's vision has been absolutely crucial to helping everyone who has been on that board since then. And I don't know if, I can't even name all the board members, but. I know Tony Malat, you were on the board for a while, and uh, your son, and Mandy, and yes. Um, it's been an amazing institution, and the future is even brighter. There's a plan to actually erect an entire new performing arts sp uh, space right where we're standing. I can't go into that now, but I specifically also want to thank Nancy for the Palmer Moose. It's a blue moose. <laughs> I'm a Palmer Moose, so. <laughs> Next, one more thanks to Lori Hagee and her genius for those young musicians from Glacier Valley Elementary School. In a word, that is what it is all about. If we can't do that, I don't know what we're doing with the arts, people, because that's, that changes lives and it makes everything better. My time is up. Uh, there's no hook, unfortunately. I'm supposed to give myself the hook, so here I go. Um, I'm very grateful that Sandy Parnell and Sean Parnell have both been very supportive of this event since uh, you were in the Lieutenant Governor's office. And since you've been governor, you've continued to be very supportive, both of you, by coming to our events in Anchorage and in Fairbanks. You stood in for Governor uh, Palin a, a, a couple times. And it's tough, you know, and so moving the event from an October thing in Anchorage or Fairbanks to Juneau, the second week of session, with weather, well, what's gonna happen? Well, today, um, Mrs. Parnell had so honorably and, and delightfully offered to do this, the silver lining to the fact that we had some fog is Governor Parnell was able to join us as well, and I think that's kismet. So a round of applause for the fog. <laughs> and with that, ladies and gentlemen, the Governor of Alaska, 
Sean Parnell. Juno Fog, the Juno Fog is good for something, isn't it? <laughs> Let me tell you what else it's good for. About a week and a half ago when we experienced this fog uh, earlier, Sandy and I took a ride and took a drive out uh, to North Douglas. And it was during the daytime, it was about one o'clock in the afternoon. It was very foggy rolling in, but the sunbeams were just streaming through the fog beautifully. And on the water, we saw what looked like a fishing vessel, the silhouette of a fishing vessel. And we both commented just what a beautiful picture that is. Uh, as the parents of a photographer, we have seen our world and our state through new eyes, uh, the eyes of, of an artist uh, in, our, in our daughter who's a, who's a photographer. And that just uh, reminds me of why we're here today. And the song, uh, Sherry Patterson, you sang it so beautifully, uh, the Alaska flag song to speak to just the, uh, the riches of Alaska as art. Thank you, Sherry, for that wonderful rendition, and Tom, Tom for helping you, too. Thank you. A couple of people I want, I want to welcome. Uh, you, re you welcomed legislators. I know that I have at least one member of my cabinet here, uh, Commissioner Mike Hanley. Would you stand up? And if any other members of our cabinet are here, would you please, uh, please stand up, too? Thank you. And Byron and Tony, it's good to see you too. Thank you for thank you for being here. Let's give them a round of applause. I mentioned just the creation of Alaska and the beauty of Alaska because Alaska is art to me. It's a powerful force. It's a powerful inspiration uh, to many to many Alaskans and to many of us. And it takes. I don't know if it takes the wisdom of years or of experience to uh, be choked up periodically by the sweeping panorama of the northern lights uh, across the sky between Barrow and Kotzebue, or those fields of fireweed uh, down by the airport here, kind of waving in the breeze, or the twinkle uh, and the stories uh, just that reside in an elder's face and the promise and hope that resides in the face of our children. Um, there's art everywhere, and it takes Alaskans, our, our fellow Alaskans, to unlock that and unleash that. And tonight, we are going to be honoring some who do that so well. And so I'm, both Sandy and I are proud to um, just be supporters of this uh, great event, whether it's in Fairbanks, Anchorage, or Juneau. Uh, we don't care. if. Uh, if we're able to be here, we will be. And so tonight, I just look forward to uh, hearing more of the rich stories that have been unlocked by Alaskans and that Alaska force of art that has been unleashed by them. So thank you for joining us, and I look forward to a great night with you. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. <clears throat> Uh, before we begin the awards, I'd like to acknowledge and thank our assistant here that's going to be on stage with us tonight. It's uh, Christina Barber. Thank you so much uh, for helping with these awards. And I, Ben made me a little bit, Ben Brown made me a little bit nervous when he mentioned that the fact I didn't realize that the, the Palmer Moose was behind me now because I, I'm a class of 88 graduate of Wasilla High School. That's our arc <laughs> rival right there, but uh, it's really unsettling for me right now. But, um, but let's go right into these awards. Uh, first, a, a little about, a bit about the awards themselves. This year's awards were created by Sarah Tabert, a, an artist from Fairbanks. Uh, Marker is the title of, of the edition of, of eight colorful woodcut prints, and uh, Ron Sanungatuk uh, Award is a woodcut monoprint. Uh, please give a big round of applause for, for Sarah and her creativity. <laughs> So this evening's first Governor's Award for the Arts, the Arts Advocacy Award, uh, goes to Cam Bowman. Cam Bowman cannot remember a time when music was not a part of her life. It was never a question that she would choose teaching as a career, and it was never a question that her teaching subject matter would be music. 
The oldest of four children, Cam was born in Anchorage, years before black and white television came north to Alaska, which meant that reading books and listening to her dad's 78 RPM records were the main sources of home entertainment. Her father, J.L. McCary Jr., loved music. It was her father who led the family singing in the car and family road trips, conducting the hymns, singing at church, or insisted that all four children took piano lessons when they reached junior high and high school. They had to participate in the band or choir. He didn't care which, but each child had to choose and they had to practice. Her mother was in charge of that part. And those 78 records, they were the music for early dancing lessons as Cam stood in her father's shoes as he propelled her around her living room. Cam states, in all of my music career as a choral teacher, conductor, piano accompanist, or festival administrator, my goal has been to keep my back to the audience so the focus of the audience's attention could be on the student performers and not me. I was just blessed to, and pleased to be a part of their music process and most definitely their proud, proud cheerleader in the background. Congratulations, Cam Bowman. Thank you very much, Governor Parnell and the Arts Council and the Humanities Forum. And I especially want to uh, um, thank um, Shannon and Karen and Audrey who, who, and many others who have made this be a very interesting day as my family is flying back to Anchorage. Some have gone to Seattle, some are in Ringo. <laughs> and you know, it's Alaska. I'm so glad to be in Alaska and have these Alaskan experiences. <laughs> so th thank you very much. Um, I had the, p the pleasure to, um, wanna, I work for the Alaska School Activities Association. Many of you know that as ASAA, and I think you think of it as an athletic ac um, organization, and it is, but they also have this wonderful niche for music and art and debate and drama. And their executive um, director is Gary Matthews, who unfortunately is retiring this year. And one of the reasons that I applied for the job and accepted the job was because he had been a former music teacher in Haynes, and I knew that he would speak the language and understand the language of music. And he has, and he does. I wish he were here tonight so I could verbally, again, thank him for, for that. Um, I believe that music is a heaven-sent gift. Some are called to be performers, some are called to be supporters, some are called to be cheerleaders. I am just grateful to be a cheerleader that helps with the, with the process. And now after watching this jam group, I understand why Junior Douglas High School and Thunder Mountain High School send me these wonderful string players to perform in our all-state events. So congratulations to all of you who were involved in that process. Um, Today is, uh, would be my father's 108th birthday. And um, that's why so much ref reference to him. And uh, he, when he was going through, he came to Alaska in 1932. To put himself to law school, he would sell Utah woolen meals for a semester, study for a semester, and back and forth until he convinced his, my mother to marry him and move forth for five years, north for five years, and then they would go home. Fortunately, they stayed. And I'm so grateful for his passion of music that he shared with me so that I could share it with others. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Cam, and congratulations. The first Humanities Award for Distinguished Service goes to Aaron Leggett. And unfortunately, Aaron was one of the individuals among a handful that were unable to join us because of uh, the weather here. There was a beautiful day here, as everyone, I think, may have noticed, except for that patch of fog that just hovered right over top of the airport and pre precluded them from, from getting into town. But we'll share with you Aaron's story. Aaron uh, works at the Anchorage Museum is, and is, is more than just a job for him. Uh, it is a, the continuation of his life's mission to learn more about his culture, the Denina, and to spread that knowledge to others. Uh, Legate's job is to help preserve knowledge of Alaska's indigenous cultures, 
whether it involves engaging in initiatives to teach people about Athabascan cultures, uh, helping put together mu museum exhibits that highlight Alaska Native artifacts, or fielding uh, phone calls from members of the general public that want to uh, know more information or have questions about the culture. For Leggett, his job is more than a means of pulling in a paycheck. It's, it's the apex of, of a lifelong journey to bring attention to his own people, the, the Eklutna Dina, a culture he always desires to know more about as a kid. Uh, recently, after seven years of hard work as a co-curator on the museum <laughs> exhibition, The Dina Way of Living, the public were finally able to learn in a comprehensive way about the indigenous inhabitants of South Central Alaska. So if you would please, at this time, even in his absence, give a hearty welcome and thank you. Congratulations to, to Aaron Leggett. And it's kind of on that note, too, uh, that the fact that, you know, the flights were canceled or redirected and so forth, that I'd share another limerick with you that I thought of. And <laughs> there once was a town called Juneau, <laughs> where soggy was the status quo. And while people you met were quite often wet, they were jovial, even so. Hopefully, hopefully it'll just get a little bit better as we go deeper into the program. <laughs> so uh, next, we have a uh, thank you to um, Vicki uh, Soboloff, or do we have Levi? Is it Vicki tonight? And the children of all, all uh, children of all nations. Our next award for this evening is coming up shortly, and they're going to come out and do a performance for us at this time. Hinu di Kiaang, Vesta Johnson di Nan U Ejin, Josephine Scott di Au U Ejin, Hasti you had to a sock, Kukak you had to a sock, Yesh Nahatsati. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. We are the All Nations Children Dancers, and we have been together since 1995, which is 17 years now. The children have um, grown through the years, and we've had many children pass through the dance group. The two assistants that you see here with me were once members of this dance group, so please give them a quick welcome. <laughs> <clears throat> the song the children entered in on is called Suhe Day, which translates, again, we will open this container of wisdom left in our care. We thought the song was very appropriate for this event this evening, the meaning um, and we feel that the children are our container of wisdom, and so we do everything we can to help the children succeed in their lives. 
and we know that the arts are a big part of that, so we appreciate everything that everyone does. Um, we would like to um, say thank you very much to Governor Parnell and Mrs. Parnell, to the Juno Arts and Humanities Council, the Alaska State Council on the Arts, for including us in this very prestigious event this evening. And we would like to congratulate all of the honorees. The children will now be performing their exit song. We hope you enjoyed this very brief presentation. Gunishchish hao'a. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Vicki Soboloff and the children of all nations. Our next award for this evening is the uh, Margaret Nick Cook Award for Alaska Native Arts and Languages. And this evening, this year's award goes to Martha Galela, artist and educator from Good News Bay. Martha is going to be escorted by her granddaughter, Robin Ichuk. Martha's nominator, Sherry Carmichael, says, Martha's openness in sharing traditional stories has improved my understanding of the Yupik culture and has made me a more sensitive teacher than I might otherwise have been. Martha hopes that young people will continue to lear, learn to weave baskets and sew parkas and learn how to hunt in order to keep Yupik traditions alive. She hopes that elders will continue to guide young people by sharing stories that tell them how to live good, healthy lives. Please help me welcome <coughs> Martha Galela. Congratulations. <laughs> I'd like to tell a story first. Uh, when I first called from the governor, uh, I was sitting down and then I had a call and then I go answer the phone. They said that they choose me to have to be here in Juno. Then I called my daughter that the, uh, I had a call from Juno that I have to be here. And then uh, she said, well, go then. They choose you. <laughs> she told me good and they choose you. They, they, they won't hurt you. They won't hurt you. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad that uh, that Mr. Carmichael chose me for this uh, to cover Margaret Cook uh, for her place. And uh, I'm not really good in English talking, but I understand a little bit and I speak very little bit. <coughs> so I wrote this, this note uh, that I'm Martha Kalela from Good News Bay. I very much want 
to say thank you for those who choose me to come to Juno. This is the first time to I come uh, to Juno. My aunt was sewing one day at her crafts. My mama's sister, but she been passed away. She was sewing some kind of crafts. Then I go over there and watching her. Then I told her that I don't know how to swing any crafts at all. And I, I don't know how to make a parkas. Then what she was sewing, she put it on the side. Then she really looked at me. Then she told me, if you're not trying to learn anything, any sewing skins, you won't learn. The first ones you sew, they won't be good. And it's true. The first ones I sew, they aren't very good. Then the first one I make a parka for my daughter, I make her collar too short. She was... <laughs> 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 when I let her put it on, she was standing like this. <laughs> It was funny. <laughs> <laughs> My auntie was sewing crafts, and I said to her that I don't know how to make any crafts. Then how how she me crafts? Then she said to me, if I ever try to make any crafts, the first ones won't be good, and it was true. When I first my uh, my daughter a little parka, she was dead. <laughs> <laughs> and after that, I keep trying and trying. Then uh, anything I make, I try to make a parkas and Eskimo parkas and mittens and out of seal skins and slippers and any kind of you use. Then I tried to teach one of my grand granddaughter how to make things. And the first thing she told me that she, her sewing can be good. Then I told what I, my aunt told me to, to keep on trying. Then later on she told me one time that she's learning how to sew in crafts. And I told her that that's what I told you. Uh, you have to keep on doing it and she will learn it. And uh, thank you for the kids that are singing down there in this uh, whatever they call dancing for us. And I'm glad to see the governor here. <laughs> <laughs> and I take my granddaughter Robin to, to come along with me because uh, I don't understand some words what when they're speaking to me because I go to school a little bit. And I'm glad that uh, Mike and Annie, they used to be teaching in the BIA school when I first working in the BIA, BIA school in Good News. And then when they come by, come by me to see me, I didn't even recognize them. But then when, they sit, when Annie said to me that uh, she was showing me the pictures that they've been taking pictures in the BIA school, then I do, I know them that uh, they've been teaching in the BI school, Mike and Anne, and I'm glad they have a pictures what they've been teaching in the school when I was working. That, but then uh, I remember their name, and, and I said, are you Mike and Anne? Yeah, they are Mike and Anne. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks very much uh, letting me standing here and talking, and uh, <coughs> I'm very much thankful that kids that have been singing and me, God bless you all.
Thank you so much, Martha. Martha. So sweet. Yeah. Uh, she's right. Uh, okay, so yeah, we all we all know that Governor Parnell is here. <laughs> He's in attendance tonight. It, that's swell. So let's all behave in hopes that he may treat the state arts budget well. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see, where am I? <laughs> our, next, our next award for distinguished service to the humanities uh, goes to Willie Hensley. We asked Willie to share with us an anecdote about his life and work, and Willie says, I have had the good fortune of enjoying a life of challenge and variety. Growing up in Kotzebue and sur the surrounding country in the dog team days before life became complicated is a real treasure. Learning to read opened up a new and mysterious wor world for me out in the country when our light was a Coleman lamp or candles or a kerosene lamp. In those days, I never ever thought that I would become a published author. Throughout my life in politics, business, and government, the one great experience I had was in Savunga. I had made my first trip out there about 45 years ago. And back in those days, there was no electricity in the villages. I, I became an advocate for electricity when I realized it was the foundation of any kind of modern advances. I, I helped create the Alaska Village Electric Cooperative that turned, out, turned on the lights across Alaska. I visited Savuga again about five years ago in the winter and decided to walk from the airport to the village by myself. As I walked, uh, a man started coming closer and closer, and by the time we got to the village, he was walking alongside me. Uh, for the longest time, he didn't say anything, and f but finally he turned to me and said, Willie, you promised electricity, and we got it. I was thrilled to hear someone remembered something like that that I had promised and delivered a lifetime ago and even more thrilled that he had recognized me almost a half a century later. Please help me in welcoming, congratulating Willie Hensley. Um, what I said was, uh, my name is Rarug. I'm a Kekek Tarugme, which is a person from Katsubu, and uh, also a Tarirme, somebody from the salt water. And my parents are John and Priscilla Hensley, non uh, and Akpayuk. And uh, I don't have a lengthy speech. I, I don't know how to make cuss bucks. <laughs> 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 I don't know how to play a violin. <laughs> you know, I'm not a carver like uh, my friend Ron Sinangatek, and a beautiful jeweler. Um, uh, but uh, it has been uh, a fascinating life uh, being uh, born up here at a time that was so much different than today. Um, our, our home was half the size of this stage out in the country, a sod house with no furniture virtually. Uh, in those days, as the speaker said, uh, our lights were Coleman lamps, kerosene lamps, and candles, and if we ran out of those, we'd use seal oil. Um, but the thing that uh, I think created the big, big biggest change in my life, uh, besides the uh, the love and compassion of my parents and family uh, was learning to read. And uh, in those days, it wasn't that easy because there wasn't much around. Uh, we were prohibited from taking books home from school, believe it or not. Uh, I'm sure if it was uh, burnable, we'd use it to start the stove. <laughs> 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 uh, that was what they were afraid of, I suspect. 
Um, and, and so, you know, with the Coleman lamp, you, you really couldn't stand there, you know, trying to read something and everybody else in the dark. Um, but uh, somehow or another, uh, I learned to read. And, uh, and oftentimes, uh, of course, it was cold because we didn't, you know, we didn't keep our homes heated all night like today. So uh, I would take a flashlight and inside my sleeping bag and, and read. And so it, it kind of opened up a new world. And um, I think if I have anything to say, it is that, uh, you know, young children absorb more than we know. And that, uh, you know, teaching and training and providing experiences uh, for them is absolutely critical. And um, I think, uh, you know, the example of the, the young uh, musicians, you know, using their skill and creativity to create something pleasurable, I think is uh, fantastic. And uh, so since uh, I'm not a sculptor or a painter or a jeweler, uh, the thing that uh, I've always been interested in is words and meanings. And <coughs> that's what I tried to convey in my memoir. What I realized was that uh, many of our own people don't get the richness of their own cultures uh, because many of our people haven't conveyed them in, in writing for the younger generations to appreciate and enjoy. And so uh, I'm here to help uh, support the, the writers who use their imaginations to create pleasure and knowledge and understanding for other people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Willie. So please welcome our next performer, a very delightful, inspiring story. I think you're going to hear from the creator of 1000 Cranes Project, Leslie Kamiko Ward. I'm moving in. Hang on. <laughs> One summer, I traveled north to the village of St. Michael. 350 people strong at the edge of the Norton Sound on my first day at school, I met the kids. Hey everyone, my name's Leslie. I'm gonna be here for a couple of weeks teaching you all some dancing and Japanese taiko drumming. But first, I'd like to get to know you. What are your names? To which the kids all replied, I, I tried not to take it personally, but I did. I took it a little personally, but that's okay. I got out the buckets that I brought from home and some rolls of clear packaging tape, and I showed the kids how they could stretch the tape across the mouth of the bucket to make these. Gomikan taiko, or trash can drums. For the kids without plumbing, this looked a lot like a toilet. And so <laughs> soon we were bonding as they all pretended to poop into <laughs> the drums. My first week in the village was amazing. I taught the kids dancing and drum songs, and in exchange, they showed me how to pluck the sea kelp off the rocks at the water's edge and eat the herring eggs. Some little girls showed me their favorite pastime, which was taking a stick and running it along a hillside, <laughs> scraping the dirt to make birds appear out of holes in the dirt that we hadn't even seen. It was like magic. 
About a week into my stay, though, there was an accident. And a young man had been trying to skip his snow machine across the surface of the water when he got and pulled under and caught. I was there beside the lake with the other villagers as they pulled his body out, and it was too late. He drowned. I heard someone shout, get the kids out of here, and I reached for the hands of the ones that I had met, and I took them to the other side of the school, and we got out our drums, and we practiced our songs away from the view of the lake, making a safe space where the kids could be until the parents came to take them home. And then I went back into the school where I'd been staying, and I stretched my sleeping bag out on the floor under the teacher's desk, and I waited. I didn't know what to do. I didn't have a phone, so I couldn't call anybody back home. I sent my parents an email. I updated my Facebook status. I felt so out of place. And everything that I had come there to do now seemed silly and stupid. Around dawn, I got an idea. Now, I say I, but that doesn't seem quite true because the idea, it felt whispered to me, if that makes any sense. And it said, fold 1,000 origami cranes. I remembered I'd seen some rolls of colored paper in the school cafeteria, and so I grabbed some safety scissors off of one of the kids' desks, and I began to cut the paper into long strips and then into small squares, and I started to fold. The next day, a teacher came in, and we talked about what had happened, and she said that she was worried. Everybody was taking the death so hard. The village, she said, was at risk for a suicide. A suicide? I said, after what we just went through, that was the worst thing I'd ever seen. And she said, yeah, this death makes number six since November, at seven months. Two were elders, and three were suicides. Three suicides in a village of 350 people in seven months, and I didn't know what to say. I told her about the cranes, and I said they were helping me feel better. And did she think it would be okay if I taught the kids how to do that instead of the dances? And she said, yeah, that's a good idea. If they come back to school, because we didn't know. On Monday, the kids all came back to school. And I told them about the cranes, and they perked up. They'd read a story in third grade called Sadako and the Thousand Cranes, about a young girl from Hiroshima who tried to wish herself well from a battle that she was fighting with cancer that she'd received from the bombs. And she started folding cranes to try and make a wish come true. Because in Japan, there's a legend that the crane lives for a thousand years, and it carries the souls of the recently departed on its back up to paradise. And anyone who folds a thousand cranes, that's one for each year of the crane's long life, gets a wish. Sadako was trying to wish herself well. She began folding cranes, but she didn't finish. She passed away, and her friends folded the cranes in her honor. So what we were doing with the cranes for Pava, for the young boy who drowned, it made sense. And the kids and I started to fold. Now, I should tell you that the crane is not an easy shape. If you've ever tried it before, someone will say, start with a hat, start with a boat. <laughs> but they don't come with wishes. So we started with cranes, and the kids were great. They started naming the folds along the way of things that they reminded them of. Beaver teeth, walrus tusks, two canoes, and... At the end of the day, they were smiling, and they asked to take stacks of the paper home to show their families what they'd learned. I went back home to Facebook, and I started a page. I called it 1,000 Cranes for Alaska, and I asked my family and my friends, watch this tutorial. I linked one from YouTube, and fold a crane with us, and send us your picture, and I'll show it to the kids at the school, and maybe it'll help cheer them up. The next day, I told the kids about the Facebook page, and we went out to in front of the school, and we did a photo shoot with all of our cranes in the sunshine at the anchor in front of the school, and then we posted the pictures on the Facebook page, and that afternoon, we received our first response from my friend Sarah Alvarez in Anchorage, who folded a crane out of a post-it note this big with the sticky side and everything. <laughs> and then, like things sometimes do in Facebook land, our story started to spread, and soon we were receiving pictures from Anchorage, from Eagle River, 
from Fairbanks, from Bethel, and then from Washington, and Oregon, and Chicago, and New Orleans. Do you know an entire Coast Guard unit from Savannah, Georgia, folded cranes and sent us their picture? By day three, we'd gone global. And the pictures that were coming in were coming in from Switzerland and from Greece. And the kids said, where's Greece? And I said, it's in Europe. And they said, where's Europe? And I said, I think it's over there. And we <laughs> opened up an atlas and we looked it up. And I watched the world open up to these kids. And then one little boy said, how do these people know who we are to care about us? And I said, it's Facebook. It's magic. <laughs> And it was working because folding cranes turned into folding hats and then making costumes and then decorating the gym. And then the kids wanted to go back to the songs and the dances. And by the time I was through, we were ready to put on a show. And we invited the families of the children and we got out the drums that we had made out of buckets and packaging tape. And we began to play. Yup. So that. Ich, ni, san, chi. And everybody clapped. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> why, thank you. And I sent the kids out to go get the cranes. And I began to talk to the adults for the first time since I'd arrived. And I told them how sorry I was about what had happened and how difficult it had been to be a stranger hiding away in their school and a witness to such a personal tragedy. At the mention of it, I watched everyone's faces crumple and cave in, and they began to cry. And I thought, oh, bad performer, you just made your whole audience cry. And I looked at the doorway in the gym, and I saw the kids waiting with the cranes. And I was like, come in, come in, come in, save me. And, and they did. They came in with a strand of cranes held aloft in each arm, and they made a wall across the gym floor. And it was beautiful. Green and yellow and blue and purple and white and red and kids and smiles and pride and hope. It didn't fix what had happened, but it matched it in strength. And now we'll never remember one without the other. I brought some cranes with me here today. Now, these are not the ones we folded in St. Michael, the 1,000 that we folded in four days. If I had done the math, I would have said it was impossible. But I'm an artist, and we don't think that far ahead. <laughs> also, trade secret, um, artist not easily daunted by the impossible, so you know. <laughs> now, these are cranes that I folded with my friends in the year following. This is a thousand. In the year following, my visit to St. Michael. They're strung on a bone that I found on the beach there, and they're anchored by feathers that I found on a beach in Mexico. And they're decorated, I don't know if you can see them from where you are, but they're decorated with the names of people who have passed. And it's become something of a traveling memorial for me and for Alaska. And I invite you to become part of our story. If there's someone that you carry in your heart, or someone's, that have passed on from this life to the great collective, please, I'm gonna leave these cranes on a table over there with some pens. Find a crane that catches your eye. Write their name. Share their story. And then listen to the voices that whisper your inspiration. Be undaunted by the impossible. And if the shit hits the fan, fold a thousand cranes. No. <laughs> Get creative. Reach out. Ask for help. Know that you may just be being prepared to receive something beautiful and amazing. And it will probably be some assembly required. <laughs> We're all in this life thing together, and that's the message of me and 1,000 Cranes. Thank you so much for having us here. Much love, peace and blessings.
Thank you so much, Leslie. That was a beautiful and inspiring story. Our next award for business leadership in the arts goes to Daryl Schaff. Reflecting on his life's work in the arts, Darrell says, my career was the result of a fortunate series of events and the kindness of strangers. Much of my childhood was spent battling severe ADD. At age five, my parents took me to a clinic which had fortunately closed. <laughs> and in its location was instead a dance school. My mother was convinced that more physical activity would wear me down. Thirty years later, I had danced professionally, toured with shows from New York, and developed a strong appreciation for the arts. Somewhere along the way, I developed a keen sense of business and began a career that allowed me to become a patron and supporter of arts and culture. I was fortunate to teach the business of art and to participate as a board member, consultant, and advisor. My circumstance allowed me to be part of the development of dance companies, youth performing groups, and to be the founding director of Very Special Arts Festivals program in Alaska. I've been an artist in schools and managed the program, overseen the repair and installation of public art, helped to raise millions of dollars, and organized nearly every major event in Anchorage in the past 30 years. Tonight is a tribute to that odd set of circumstances that brought all of this to be. And I'm so thankful for my life and the impact that arts have had. Please help me welcome Mr. Darl Schaff. What we live with, we learned. What we learn, we practice. What we practice, we become. And what we become has consequence. I lived with art and with business. I practiced the best of both, and I became a success. But much of that success was based on four groups of people. The amazing professionals that surrounded me. A good example would be my partner, Brooke Corkery, and this incredible company, Art Services North, that we developed together. Second group would be the people who stuck with me. These would be friends who have been there for years, who pushed me and pushed me and always said, you can do more, you can do more. That would be Diana Birch. <laughs> A third group are new people that have come into my life and volunteered to be part of some crazy idea that I have. Lana Markey is joining us tonight, a new board member on an organization that we just formed last year. And the last group of people, and this is the most important, are all the strangers that you haven't met yet. Those are the people who really make your life rich, who join with you, who become partners in whatever crazy scheme you can possibly come up with. I said earlier that, that what we become has consequences, and I can tell you that winning this award tonight is a consequence of my life, and I could not be happier about it. Thank you so much. Humanities is a big word, where humans' disciplines are blurred. It's culture and thought, or a sip of great scotch, or a limerick of the absurd. <laughs> Our next award for distinguished service to the humanities goes to Patty Relay. When reflecting on the power of the arts and museums, Patty says, ever since I can remember, I have loved going to museums. Growing up, my mother loved to travel. We traveled quite frequently to Europe, where my lifelong love of museums began to grow. Still fervently etched in my memories are the experience of seeing Mona Lisa at the Louvre, or the Black Watch at Reich's Museum, or the Potato Eaters at the, at the Van Gogh Museum. I can still remember one time I was wandering around the Reichsmuseum trying to get away from my family. 
and I stumbled upon a little known area where students were studying art history, examining uh, unframed canvases of Hi Hieronymus Bosch or, or Peter uh, uh, Bruegel, or to name a few. At first, I just stood in awe. Uh, where, what a wonderful way to learn about the past. Uh, I asked the security guard if I could come in as well. And all I had to do was leave my ID at the door, and there I was, in a room with canvases from artists I'd only seen in art history lectures or in books. I knew right then I was home. Later in life, these experiences drove me to completing my undergraduate degree in art history and a master's in arts administration. It is more than the art or the objects that museums display. It is about the frames of reference that the art and the artifacts play in telling the human story. Museums serve as vital community resources that provide gathering places where thoughtful exhibits and educational opportunities coexist, bringing communities together to learn, to play, and to delight in. Please help me welcome Patty Relay. Thank you, everyone. I'm frankly in, in awe standing on this stage with wonderful storytellers and, and cranes, and, but oh my, it, this, is, this is just an extreme honor. I wrote down a few words because I knew I was going to be a touch nervous, so bear with me. <laughs> so as I said, I'm, I find myself extremely honored receiving this award, the Governor's Award for uh, Distinguished Service in the Humanities. The humanities are more than history to me. They're the arts, they're stories, they're, it's, it's more than, it's more than the, the artifacts and the relics that museums store. I'm very grateful for the re recognition from the Alaska Humanities Forum of the work I have accomplished at the Valdez Museum and Historical Archive. I've, uh, I've actually only been in Alaska, well, this is my second time, but the <clears throat> most recently we moved here from Washington in 2010, and <clears throat> I came with a philosophy that museums and galleries, as my introduction uh, stated, they're mu much more than places to store works of art, relics, artifacts. They serve as vital community resources that provide gathering places for thoughtful exhibits and um, educational opportunities. Bringing, to g bringing communities together. It's all about bringing the community together. Now really incorporating that philosophy uh, takes a group effort. <clears throat> I couldn't have achieved what, what we've accomplished so far without a dynamic team. That includes a really dedicated, supportive board and a, compa and a very passionate, dedicated, hardworking staff. I have a whole list of people I could thank tonight, but you'd start, start yawning and I don't want to bore you. But anyway, I would, but I would like to especially thank a couple of people. <coughs> Most importantly, <coughs> Emmy Swanson, She's a board president for, and for all of her support. And Faith Ravel, she's sitting right over here tonight. She's our wonderful dynamic curator of education and public programs for her tireless work that she has taken on to find creative ways to teach history through art making. So when did we know we were on the right track? Well, over the last two years, we've received a lot of positive feedback. Did you know we learned that 87% of the people surveyed that came to our museum said that we were one of the best in the state of Alaska? And we also learned that 97% of the visitors said that the museum staff was welcoming and friendly. It's a nice, safe place to come. It's dynamic exhibits. And thirdly, we, we noted that 90% thought that our admission fees were a good value, so a valuable community resource. I sincerely thank everyone uh, for helping me reach a stage where I can proudly hold up this award as a mark of achievement. And I also promise you here tonight that we will continue to grow as a dynamic and engaging museum that finds creative and positive ways to be part of preserving, presenting, and interpreting the heritage and culture of Valdez, the Copper River Basin, Prince William Sound, and all of Alaska. Thank you very much for this honor.
Thank you, Patty, and congratulations. And now please join me in welcoming our next performers, current and past state writers, Nora and Dick Dauenhauer. And, and also artist Ishmael Hope. Good evening, I'm going to start off our presentation. Um, I'd like to begin by pointing out some of the unique features of our joint presentation tonight. Uh, first of all, as far as I know, this is the first his and hers laureates in history. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all right. <laughs> hmm. And this is, this is certainly true for Alaska. Uh, probably for the entire United States and possibly for the whole world. <laughs> so we're, that's unique for Juno anyhow. So I was Poet Laureate back in the 1980s. That was some 30 years ago and Nora is now the State Writer Laureate for 2012-2014. Uh, I had the longest tenure of any Writer Laureate. Uh, but this is not because of the quality of my verse but <laughs> because the Alaska Poetry Society, and we're not sure the name, I thought it was the, the Juno Poetry Society. Anyhow, they started the laureate program and they went defunct while I was the poet laureate. <laughs> <laughs> so it took me a while to uh, find some um, courageous organization that would take over the program. So we're grateful to the Alaska State Council on the Arts for doing so. And shortly after that, uh, uh, the, 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 the person, um, former uh, laureate John Haynes, was the primary advocate for changing the title to writer laureate and rotating genres so we could add prose and, and, and playwriting along with poetry. So the program started here in Juneau, in good old fogbound Juneau. And I'd like to say a few more words about that. The laureateship was established in 1963 by the Poetry Society, which in turn was established by Carol Berry Davis. Uh, Carol Berry Davis was responsible for all of this. She deserves enormous praise for what she did, not only with poetry, but with music and the arts in general. And some of us feel that she seems to have been forgotten, and th this is troubling to us. As far as we know, she was also a poet laureate from 1967 to 69, uh, but this doesn't show up in any of the records. So I can't really go into any detail, but I'm hoping that um, perhaps the Council on the Arts could commission someone to research the early history of the program uh, and the laureates. Okay, now I'll turn over to my co-presenters, uh, current State Writer Laureate Nora Downhauer and Juno Writer uh, Ishmael Hope. Uh, they're going to begin with a dramatic reading of a Thinket speech for the removal of grief uh, delivered by David Kadishan and Huna uh, and translated by Nora. Then Ishmael will read a short poem uh, and then Nora will conclude with a short poem and one even shorter. Um, one thing I'd like to add that um, people have been commenting all evening on our vests and these are also connected to the uh, Governor's Award for the Art. They were made by Nora's mother, Emma Marks, who was a recipient of the Governor's Award for the Arts way back. Uh, governor Cooper was, was the, the governor then, and I'm... Uh, <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> our next... <laughs> our next don't uh, hang up on these. These are good. <laughs> okay, thank you. I want to say it's such a beautiful honor to be standing here with a mentor and teacher. <laughs> she's one of my closest mentors and teachers. Teaches us how she's, she talks about how she's thinget through and through. And I just think about how many generations it'll take to try to get to that point again. Um, but we have the resources. Um, and with great thanks to the work of Nora and of Richard. So. Very nice shoes. Mm -hmm. 
Governor, honored guests, welcome to Juno. Those of you who are coming from far, far from Juno and not too far from Juno like Ogbe. <laughs> <laughs> I will start the David Kadashan speech. Um, I stumbled on David Kadashan. Uh, I was just more or less playing around with my writing. And I came across on how to transcribe Thingit. That's my language. And um, I took off from there. All the stuff I've been writing is in Thingit first and then translated into English. So here's David Kadashan. When on 1968, my father's brothers, all my brothers-in-law, oh, we. we are feeling it, your pain, feeling it. I will imitate my mother's brother, son of Kagish, your child, Satkan Govakan. Hey. I will imitate your brother-in-law. My brother-in-law, Kityanayi. Kadushtu. I will imitate your brother-in-law, Kusatan. I will imitate your child. Surely this is a difficult thing to do, a thing like this, insensitive. We are in need of my mother's brothers. The river would swell, the river in the lake, the rain would fall on the water. When the river had swollen, it would flow under the tree the earth would crumble along the bank. That's when it would think of breaking. When it had broken down the river, it would drift. It would think of going out into the world. On this great ocean, it would drift. From there, the wind would blow over it. Your brothers-in-law are listening to you. After the wind would blow over it, it would begin to roll with the waves to a fine sand. When it rolled on the waves to the sand, it would drift ashore. It would be pounded there by the waves. It would be pounded there. Here the tide would leave it dry, would leave it dry. It would lie there. In the mornings, sun would begin to shine on it. In the morning, after the sun had been shining on it, it would begin to dry out. My hope is that you become like this. From now on, my brothers-in-law, whoever is one, gonna teach. You created me, Chukanedi. You created me. This is why I too feel for you. Yes, this is the way Kwainak is. In this world, we're still holding each other's hands. Neither do we overlook our dead. Yes, at this moment. When the sun shines on it, my hope is that it dries the flowing from your faces. Let it turn to joy is my wish.
Gunatish, Gunatish. Oh no, your brothers in law, your father's sisters. Gunatish, Gunatish. This is the way it is. Yes, you will stand the way your father's brothers used to do when such things happened. Yes, these are the things that might warm your feelings. The people I'm living in place of now, yes, used to bring these out for you to see. This is the way it is. Gunatish, Gunatish. My brothers-in-law, those who are my father's brothers. Oh, hey. Those who are my father's sisters. Oh, hey. We will only imitate our ancestors. There is no way they can do anything for you. You can see them wearing them. Yes, we will try. This is the way it is. This is all. This is all. Gunatish, 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 Achish, Has, Gunatish. Okay. So beautiful to hear the words of Katya and through Nora's voice, Katya David Kadashan. And so I, I wrote a little poem in, um, just in inspiration of, of Nora. And when I think of Nora, I think of how much how necessary it is to support our Alaska Native women. How necessary that is um, with everything we got, everything. So, talking to Nora. Nora told me today that your life's a poem. There's no time for a rewrite. It doesn't do any good to crack open the book out of harm's way. I am walking the path of grief and longing without satisfaction in sight. I just grew tired of wearing my reptilian skin, so I stood up. There are many things to grieve over. A thousand cry songs wait to be sung. It's okay. One crumb to the fire is a feast for the dead. Thank a person even when it's hard, she said. And now I know why halos could be seen on angels and young men could heat the ocean. Many voices now sing at the same time, alive in the eddies making his way home. The woman under the ice thaws her black hair. I was smiling after talking to Nora today. I can't help but think of the conference of the birds where the raven got in over his head. Gunatish. wanted to try something new. A lot of times I couldn't do what I wanted to do. But anyway, I ended up writing a poem this time. If Mona, oh, let me tell you first. My mother came from Elsick River and this poem uh, refers to Alsek area. And I think of my mother when I read it. Okay, here's. If Monet had only seen the flowers at Alsek River, I bet he would have painted impressions of them. The landing beach alone, all covered with fireweed, 
going along the beach, down river, wild asters, along the trail to Elsa Lake, more fireweed, perfusions of Indian paintbrush in red and orange, yellow, pink pyrolas, purple larkspurs, grass of Parnassus, anemone, chocolate lilies, Jacob's ladder, strawberries, at Elsa Lake, more fireweed, dwarf around our sauna pond. I would love to see how Monet would have seen these against the Elsa Glacier, icebergs, Mount Fairweather, capped with ice and sunlight. And for my last poem, I'd like to do uh, my last uh, reading. I'd like to do Granddaughter's Dancing. It's a poem. Granddaughter's Dancing. Blossoms swaying in the wind. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Dick and Nora Dauenhauer and Ishmael Ho. Our next award uh, for individual artists goes to Palmer writer Eowyn Ivey. As a newspaper reporter, fiction writer, and lifelong Alaskan, Eowyn Ivey felt like she was always searching for the story she wanted to tell. One winter evening, uh, as she was uh, shelving books at Fireside Books in Palmer, it, it was there that she came across a children's picture book illustrated by the Alaskan artist Barbara uh, Lavallee. It told of an old man and woman who build a, a gir little girl out of snow and she comes to life. Eowyn based her debut novel, The Snow Child, on this Russian fairy tale and she set it on an Alaskan homestead in a river valley very much like the Matanuska where she grew up and still lives with her husband and two daughters. The path of the snow child has since taken her and her family around the world but she is always grateful to return home to Alaska. Please help me welcome and congratulate A.O. and Ivy. As a um, 1991 Palmer High grad, um, I'm kind of, I like this moose back here. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Um, and also having grown up here in Alaska um, and still call this place home, I, I can tell you it's an incredible honor to be here tonight um, to um, have my home state um, give an award like this to me. And, and looking over the recipient lists over the years and today, um, these are some of the writers and artists and musicians that I have grown up um, admiring. And to be in that company um, is incredibly moving. Um, I have a few people I just want to thank very quickly. Um, I want to thank uh, Diane Kaplan and Jason Smart with the Rasmussen Foundation. I have a lot of things to thank them for, actually, um, and the support that they lend writers, but particularly for nominating me. Um, and of course, I want to thank the um, Alaska State Council on the Arts and the Alaska Humanities Forum. Thank you to Governor Parnell and the First Lady. Um, and most of all, I want to thank my family. They couldn't come down here tonight, um, but really they are the ones who inspire me and believe in me. Um, my mom, Julie LeMay, the poet, 
my dad, John LeMay, the reader, um, <laughs> my, uh, my two daughters, uh, Grace and Aurora, and my husband, Sam. And I have to say, too, that being here tonight um, is, an, I think, particularly moving because I see how much we've done um, with we, uh, to see all the different performances tonight um, and how much potential there is and the young people coming up and thinking about my own daughters. And I just hope we continue to make Alaska a place where um, writers and artists want to make a home. Um, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Eowyn. <coughs> so our next award, unfortunately, is another uh, recipient that was unable to join us this evening. Um, you know, this town of ours, it, it's, uh, it is indeed one of rain. I mean, and rain, and rain. Uh, driving some insane. Uh, <laughs> when asked if there's a cure for it, some would say it's the Eagle Crest Summit. And for others, it's to jump on the Maui plane. So our next Distinguished Service Award to the humanities goes to Eva uh, Salidas. Re reflecting on her introduction to writing, Eva says, I came to work in the humanities in the 90s, living in a remote field camp in Prince William Sound, studying orca and humpback whales after the Exxon Valdez oil spill, and collecting data for my master's degree. I lived for five summers on an island 60 miles from Whittier. My field assistant was the Alaskan-born poet Molly Lou Freeman. And when she first joined me at the field camp, she was taking courses in environmental studies at Brown. But in her heart, she was a poet. She mentioned me early in the practice, to, she mentioned to me early in the practice that, that constitutes the life of the artist, the devotion to writing that is absolutely integrated in everyday living. And that shapes how one sees and experiences the world. I mentored her in the, st in the strictures of field biology, and together, during our four month long field seasons, we created a life that entwines science and art and adventure and philosophy. In the form of questions, we asked one another as we roamed around the sound in a 20-foot skiff in the rain and wind searching for whales. The combination of literature, writing, inquiry, observation, and science shaped the kind of writing I've done ever since. And I'm still circling those questions through my poetry, my creative nonfiction writing, and my work as a biologist. Now again, unfortunately, Eva was unable to join us in person this evening to accept her reward, but she's uh, recorded a small video that we're going to go ahead and roll for you now. Thank you so much to the Alaska Humanities Forum for this honor and to the writers who, unbeknownst to me, nominated me and wrote letters on my behalf. Thank you to an organization that recognizes the importance of telling stories, stories that matter, that bridge distances and disciplines and ways of life and ways of knowing and seeing. I looked online at the Alaska Humanities Forum logo, which includes the words stewardship, respect, curiosity, dialogue, and inclusiveness. To be recognized as playing a part in promoting those values is a tremendous affirmation and inspires me to continue in my work to weave art and science toward what the late poet Adrian Rich called the dream of a common language. Thank you to all of my teachers and students and fellow artists in Alaska who manifest that dream every day. From my mother tongue and across miles of ocean, I send you my deepest palbias. We have with us tonight a former student of Eva's, uh, Mr. Tim Lash. He's here to accept the award on her behalf. Let's please give Eva and, and Tim a round of applause. Congratulations. Next, we would like to announce the 2013 recipients of the Connie Buchiever Fellowship. 
This fellowship is given every two years to emerging artists in a variety of disciplines. Connie Buchifer was an avid performer, director, and producer of community theater and was a lifelong patron and advocate of the arts. The Buchifer family endowed this award in 2001, and we're fortunate this evening we have the members of the family here with us tonight, the Buchifer sisters. We have Linda, Anne, Mimi, and Barbara. If you Please stand if you would, please. I want to thank you and the Buchiver family so much for your dedication and support of the arts. And now with the Buchiver uh, uh, Fellows, and uh, we would ask that you please hold your applause to the end. I'll name them as follows. The Literary Arts Fellow, Aaron Hollowell from Palmer. Literary Arts Fellow, Lucas Rowley from Anchorage. Literary Arts Fellow, Nicole Stellan O'Donnell from Fairbanks. Literary Arts Fellow, Lance Twitchell from Juneau. And finally, Performing Arts Fellow, Allison Warden from Anchorage. Allison was supposed to be here with us tonight. Uh, we were looking forward to her performance, but again, unfortunately, the planes have flown over with her and several others. <laughs> but on, you know, a side note here, I want to give a shout out to the Jack um, and this facility and what it's growing and expanding, what a great facility this is. You, you may have heard of a place called the Jack. Uh, it was an armory many years back. Uh, <laughs> now it's a place for the arts, not for the smarts or the darts or Okay, uh, <laughs> sometimes their MCs are kind of whack. <laughs> so now we've come to our last award for the evening. Uh, this is a special award, uh, a lifetime achievement award for the arts and humanities. The Arts Council and Humanities Forums are thrilled to be honoring Ron Sanungatuk with this joint award. Sarah Tabert, the creator of the awards this year, shares, as a kid in Fairbanks, Ron was one of the first people I knew had, who had artist as their job title. That was a career option ended up being fairly useful information. I've come across Ron's work all over the state and I'm always interested and impressed by, by that work. And it's an honor to have been asked to make a peace award for him. We have a short video created for this award and created by Homer filmmaker and friend of Ron, Michael Walsh. I started teaching four years of Western art and I noticed pretty poor conditions in native art. You've got to try to understand that we had no art, native or anybody else. Only art was those pioneering uh, who were interested in painting of Mount McKinley and then pretty Eskimos in their sleds and huskies. We certainly, even at the uh, beginning of the Arts Council, we certainly were aware that we got to catch up pretty soon, very soon. Uh, whoever heard, heard of opera? Uh, uh, let's have some. <laughs> Thank you. 
it's almost impossible to overstate his importance. He's not only almost certainly the most widely exhibited Alaskan artist, really the dean of all Alaska artists, but has been a mentor to generations of both native artists and non-native artists, and an example for all of us about how you can be a great teacher, a great mentor, a great spokesperson for the arts, and also be a great artist who can be recognized not just on the local and regional and statewide level, but on a national and international level as he's been. We had native knowledge, mm -hmm. but as far as Western requir requirements go, I was a guinea pig in Fairbanks. Oh, this guy, we ought to keep him. He's a, he's a model. And I did, 25 years. Somebody will say, our art is good. Mm -hmm. Somebody will declare, we're no longer secondary, we're first. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't need to be first, but you're <laughs> reaching that goal, you know? And I feel good about that. So Ron shared with us this story. When I left my village of Wales to go to school at Mount Edgecombe, I knew little about the changing ways of the world coming up. I now realize that Wales was, was a pretty good prep school for the future. As teenagers, my friends and I were accomplished in chore duties and equally versed in play. We maintained water supply for our families, made sure the wood storages were full, and we took care of the dog team. We also emptied buckets and learned how to carve ivory and hunt. From early on, we had to make our own toys. For example, we knew how to make whaling boats by flattening and reshaping five-gallon tin cans equipped with sails made from flour sacks. The village pond was our playground for our sailboats, as were the hills behind the village for sledding. All our sleds and skates were homemade, and I think this early work and play prepared me well to become a craftsman and artist. Now, Ron was a founding member of the Alaska Council on the Arts, and in, in addition to being a, the founder of UAF's Native Arts Department, Again, unfortunately, we so wish that he could have joined us e this evening. And accepting his award on his behalf is Mr. Kess Woodward. Please help me welcome and congratulate Mr. Woodward. It's a great honor and deeply humbling to accept this award on behalf of my old friend, Ron Sanungatuck. I'm so sorry that he and his extraordinarily talented and wonderful wife, Turid, are stuck in Sitka and can't be here with us tonight. Uh, 10 years ago, I received the first Governor's Award for Lifetime Achievement in the Arts, and I can't tell you how much Ron would enjoy one-upping me by receiving the first Lifetime Achievement Award for both the arts and the humanities. Ron and I. <laughs> <Woo -hoo! laughs> 
Ron and I taught together for decades. We've traveled by canoe and snow machine and foot and skis and hunted and fished together for years and years. He gave my son his Inupiat name. He made an extraordinarily beautiful feast dish for my dear late wife, Missy, when she finished her long journey through medical training. Much more importantly, he has been a mentor and an inspiration to all of us in the arts and the humanities in Alaska. And I would ask you to rise and send your greetings and your congratulations to one who, for all of us in the arts and humanities, is one of the most distinguished elders of us all. Thank you. was once built in the wrong spot. <laughs> it was either too cold, too windy, or too hot. The fog rolled in, the stress came again, and now, tonight, some artists will be sleeping on cots. <laughs> We've had a tremendous slate of awardees this evening, folks. Uh, please join me in one last round of applause for these, these recipients and the wonderful work that these folks do. I'd like to once again sincerely thank our sponsors. Without their support and help, it would make it very difficult to pull this event off. And those sponsors are ConocoPhillips, BP, GCI, the Rasmussen Foundation, Shell, Wells Fargo, the Margaret Nick Cook family, Sea Alaska Heritage Institute, and the Foraker Group. Thank you all for your contributions. And now on behalf of the Alaska Humanities Forum, the Alaska State Council on the Arts, and the Office of the Governor, I would like to thank all of you for coming tonight and help us honor those individuals and organizations to make life in Alaska richer for all of us. And to close with you one last final limerick <laughs> before I turn it over to the fine musicians, Kari Groovin, Clay Good, and Tom Loker to finish off the evening with some fine music. Art and humanities have their place in the world, as in the finer things with which we would like to swirl. Let tonight be a reminder, when you need an inspiration finder, look to the arts where beauty, love, and life unfurl. Good night, folks. Thank you very much. So um, I believe Sitka is having a great party right now with all of these great people <laughs> being over there. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just wanted to say, um, when I came over from Norway, I was um, skeptical about this place, to say the least. I did not come for the, for the beauty of of Alaska, I came for a man. <laughs> and I was thinking very fast that I needed to get this man out of here and back to Norway with me. But then, something happened. Um, there was a little theater down the street and they had this crazy show on where they had turned their stage into a swimming pool. Uh, the show was called um, Metamorphosis and that's when I started to kind of realize this can be a pretty interesting place to be <laughs> when they allow these things to happen. <laughs> and uh, then I got the great fortune, fortune of uh, working with Nancy, uh, starting working with her uh, right before we moved in here. 
which is why I'm up on stage right now, because I was supposed to be moving chairs and <laughs> not be singing tonight. Um, and uh, this place is amazing for arts. It's so, it's, it's sizzling. It's, uh, it's so much crazy stuff going on. And I'm, I feel, man, I want to, I want to speak. No, I want to sing. Okay. This song is, uh, I brought with me from uh, S Sweden, which is next to Norway. And I like it very much. And now everybody feel free to stretch your arms, move around, socialize, have a lovely time. Endast en gång såg jag en man Mina ögon blev som förvända Så som vinden gångade han Rask ordet säker att segra Han såg på mig och han log Han såg min ros och log Sen han gångade mig Den gång såg jag den man Mina ögon blev som förvända Sådan man, sån en man är han Att hans hand ett liv kan fullända Han tog på mig och han låg Han tog min låg och låg Sen han gångade mig förbi Sen gång såg jag den man Mina ögon blev som förvända Sådan man, sådan en man är han Att hans hand ett liv kan fullända Broadcast of the Governor's Arts Awards is made possible by the Office of the Governor, Conoco Phillips, the Alaska State Council on the Arts, the Alaska Humanities Forum, and 360 North.